also recording. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Um, my name is Nicole Davis and I am the one of the co-programming chairs for YMP and Cleveland um, Board of Directors. This is our final um, our final webinar in our in our managing career series. And today we have um, Professor Jeffrey Bowen who has been so gracious enough to join us and talk to us a little bit about the post-interview process. Um, so a little bit about um, Professor Bowen. He is a certified fundraising executive and a board source certified governance trainer with a BA in psychology from Kent State University and both a master's of nonprofit organizations and an appreciative inquiry certificate in positive business and society change from the Weatherhead School of Management at Case Western Reserve University. In addition to many years in sales and marketing management, uh, Jeffrey's career as a nonprofit professional includes working as a crisis intervention counselor, youth services caseworker, after school program fundraiser as director of development and public affairs for the Lake Erie Girl Scout Council, and as the executive director of Greater Cleveland Habitat for Humanity. So Jeffrey is a full-time faculty member at Maxine Goodman Levin College of Urban Affairs at Cleveland State University, serving as a college lecturer in organizational leadership and teaching undergraduate and graduate level courses in nonprofit management, organizational leadership, and fundraising. He serves as co-chair in the Levin College Dean's Diversity Council as a member of the CSU President's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force, as a member of the Master of Nonprofit Administration and Leadership Advisory Committee, and as an advisor to the Center for Public and Nonprofit Management. He is faculty for record for the Neighborhood Leadership Cleveland Program and serves on the Board of Directors of College Boarding Pass. In his various roles as both a nonprofit and for-profit executive, Professor Bowen has been involved in the creation and justification of job descriptions, manage, managing employee search processes, processes, excuse me, interviewing prospective candidates and directing the recruitment, selection, and training of staff and volunteers. So side note, um, Professor Bowen is actually my professor and during my undergraduate um, studies at CSU. So I am very fond of him and very, very elated that he is here today. So without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Professor Bowen, to get started. Thank you again for being here. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. And thanks for having me. Um, and um, as a <clears throat> as a lifelong, uh, long-time nonprofit practitioner, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be helping um, the Young Nonprofit Professionals Network Organization. And I'm glad that you guys exist and, and hope that the chapter will continue to grow uh, <clears throat> and to continue its, uh, its connectivity to the Levin College of Urban Affairs at Cleveland State. Um, I am going to uh, um, drop on my screen share here and see if I can't um, share this PowerPoint with you. And we will take it from the beginning. There we go. Everybody can see this. Is that right? Post interview process. You got it. Um, so what I'm going to do today is uh, in, in keeping with the way this program uh, format has been working for you guys is I'm going to do a, a brief presentation <clears throat> about some things that I thought were important to sort of put on the table based on my experience, uh, which our colleague has uh, uh, so graciously shared with you already. Um, and then we will open it up to a conversation and, and see what, you know, what you folks have. Um, and it was fun for me to do this because it, it, it forced me to sort of think about what <clears throat> my experiences have been on the various sides of the table, you know, so as, as a, as a, um, a nonprofit, uh, a young nonprofit professional, and then a restaurant professional, and then a restaurant manager, uh, and then um, you know moving through a sales and marketing career, and then back into nonprofit work. Um, I, I've, I've been a job seeker, uh, an internship creator, an internship uh, seeker. Um, uh, I've created job descriptions for folks, um, you know, funded them through various sources. Uh, interviewed for the process, managed the process, you know, so I've, I've been in this, in this painful or joyful, as the case may be, uh, go, go get a new gig experience um, in, in, in both the for-profit and nonprofit sector and over many years on both sides of the table. So hopefully I've got some insight to bring to bear. Um, I also spent some time doing some, some research just to sort of get the flavor for what the, the, um, 
the current trends are and, and found that indeed, um, you know, what I know to be true from my years of experience is all also reflected in the current literature, um, which always makes me happy as an academic. Um, so, and just another quick note, as an academic, and, and you already heard about my um, <clears throat> my credentials in the introduction, but because um, uh, I came to the Levin College because of my years of experience. So it was, it was the 25 years as a nonprofit leader manager, uh, plus the preceding sales and marketing uh, experience that, that got me the job as a college lecturer. Um, you know, so the university has these tracks where we bring in professionals from the community as full-time teachers uh, to provide students with an opportunity to, to engage with people that know this from a first-hand perspective. So um, without further ado, um, <clears throat> the post-interview process requires embracing uh, and countering delays, rejection, and ghosting. Uh, you know, it, it's a numbers game. Uh, I, I've got to put out a bazillion resumes to get a few responses. I, I got to chase a whole bunch of people to get some interviews. I got to go through a whole lot of interviews to get the second interview, et cetera, uh, th throughout the process. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing right out of the box is, is you're not alone. As, you know, and for those of you who have been on a hunt for a while or you've been in a search, you're, you're either working a job <clears throat> full time and trying to look for work part time, or you're going to school and trying to find a job, or you're on a job that's a dead end and you're trying to find a, a different, better job or you're in a job that you like, that you're good at, that you've had for a long time, but it's not your passion, it's not what you're trying to do. Um, in, in, no matter where you're coming from in the process, it's a pain in the neck, it's high anxiety, uh, it requires due diligence, and it's also important to remember that you're not alone. And, and particularly when you talk about the post-interview process, 60% of people, um, <clears throat> Workplace Trends Candidate Experience Study found that 60% of job seekers have had a poor candidate experience. So more than half of the people out there who are looking for a job when surveyed say this was not a good time and they didn't treat me right and I didn't feel good about this. 65% um, say that they never or rarely receive notice of an employer's final uh, decision. So I went through all this, pro you know, so you talk about ghosting, I went through all this process and, it, you know, nothing, I, I don't know. Um, so. So again, not only more than half, but but 65%, which to me was a really significant number, um, report that they they didn't get uh, the, the final decision. <clears throat> and then this is also interesting and telling, 94% of job seekers report that they want to receive interview feedback, but only 41% actually do. So, you know, if, if there's anything to be said here, it's that you're not alone in this. You know, if the process feels weird, it's because it's weird. If it feels like like you're like you're running a, a race against a bunch of other candidates and and uh, you know it, it's exhausting, it's because it is. Um, so so you know my goal today is to if if nothing else is to help you understand that that it, that's just the nature of the beast. Our job is to tame the beast, if you will. Um, and and if we can do that, uh, the, the process will be more fun and ultimately hopefully more productive for you. Um, and also it's not personal, you know, that all of these things that, that we just talked about in terms of, you know, people feeling poorly treated, not getting enough information, never hearing a final answer, never getting a call back, all of that stuff. It, it's, it's not about you. It's just the way the process sometimes works. Um, sometimes it was never actually going to be your job. Um, <clears throat> know that the headhunter or the recruiter will put you in a light up against a preferred candidate because they get provide they get paid to provide three well vetted candidates. So if you're going through a headhunter, if you're going through a search firm, um, they're going to bring three well vetted candidates uh, to the to, to the table. That's their job. That's how they get paid. Um, they may have a preferred candidate. The organization may have a preferred candidate, and you may not be it. But if you're good enough, you're qualified. You interview well. You you know you pass the muster with the search firm. Or the recruiter, then you get into the mix. But it was never really going to be your job, uh, and so it's important to just understand in the process that just because a recruiter puts you in the mix doesn't mean that you're necessarily uh, the person that they consider to be the top candidate. Um, uh, sometimes there's simply better chemistry with a different candidate. Your paper looks good, your interview looks good, your references were awesome, everything checks out. You know, by all rights, you should be the one getting this job. But we went through the whole process. There's, we're down to two candidates, and and the, um, um, you know, we sent those final two candidates to the board. We sent them to the staff. 
uh, you know, we, we sent them to the executive director and everybody agreed that both of those candidates were fabulous and, and leave it up to the ED to make her final decision. And she just likes Brittany better. It's not personal. You know, it's, it's, it's not that James isn't the right guy for the job. She, there's just something in the chemistry that makes her go, mm, I, I, you know, this, this, I like her better. Um, you know, it's a gut feeling. And again, that's okay. You know, it, it, it does not reflect on your ability as the candidate. That's just the person who, who, who felt right in the moment. Um, sometimes it may be your fault. Sometimes you messed up on a small detail and you have to keep in mind that there are way more applications that they need, that they're vetting, you know, anywhere from dozens to hundreds of applications to decide who to interview. Um, know that they, they hate to say no, especially when they've gone through the process, that you, you've been through the grind, you've had a couple interviews, you've been vetted, they've checked your references, checked your background, gone through all of that process with you. And the person who's running the process, whether it be the executive director herself managing the job, whether it's the HR person, the, the, uh, the, the recruit firm, whoever it is, they really like you, They're, you know, and they do not want to tell you that it's no. Um, and, you know, and, and it's hard for them to make a decision. So if you, if you mess up on something, silly stuff, grammar, syntax, spelling, punctuation, capitalization, proper noun, spacing, formatting, keep in mind that everything that you do in writing is being evaluated. So when you send them a text after the meeting to say, thank you so much, that was awesome. Don't forget to, to, you know, to use proper English, proper grammar, punctuation in your text, in your email, all of your communication. If you're communicating with them via Facebook Messenger, uppercase, periods, paragraphs, everything needs to be there. Uh, slang, acronyms, subject headings, all of that stuff. Um, acronyms is a funny thing because everybody knows that it's YNPN, except the people in the room that don't have any idea what that is. So, so it's important if I'm in the room with you guys to talk about you know, YNPN because that shows you that I'm up, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm in the mix. But it's, it's more important to say the Young Nonprofit Professionals Network Right, because because that tells everybody in the room who who we're dealing with, and it's important for us when we're in the interview to act like we're going to act in the community. You know, so on the one hand, you want to show your chops, you want to show I understand the buzzwords of whatever this business is that you're trying to get engaged with, but by the same time, don't shorten to the acronym. Show them that you know the stuff by actually saying the words or spelling out the words. Um, never shorten somebody's name without asking. Remember, it's always punctuality, presence, presentation. Um, all of those things count. Um, so once in a while, there will be some small detail, not enough to really say, God, that's, you know, I, I booted Nicole because she sent me a crappy looking text message, you know, but what it is, it's, it's, I was having a tough time deciding between Brittany, Nicole, and James. And then Nicole sent me a rough text message. And then I, and then I, you know, there was that uh, error on her cover letter that, that, you know, that gave me pause. And, and my staff person wrote on the envelope package that it was three days late. Now I start to take all of those little details and go, you know what, it's easier for me to push her aside based on a few minor errors. Now all I got to do is decide between Brittany and James, you know? So, so keep in mind that the people who are on the other side of fence are trying to make tough decisions. And, and, and so don't give them any reason to throw your application out. Um, <clears throat> And it's always professional. We're always professional and they're always professional. And my job is to find a job. So whether I'm working full time and doing this after hours, whether I'm going to school part time, working part time, and I got three kids and I'm taking care of my mom and all those other things that people are doing in the real world on a day by day basis. If you're looking to make a change or if you're looking to land a job, you know, coming out of college or coming off of a, an unrelated job, your job is to find a job, <clears throat> full-time or part-time. I'm not talking about the job you wanna find. I'm talking about your job as a job seeker is either a full-time job or a part-time job. If you are unemployed, you got nothing else going on and you're trying to find a full-time job, then you should be looking for work from nine to five. You should get up on Monday morning, take a shower, you know, have breakfast, do what you do, sit down in the chair at the desk at nine o'clock and get to work. Um, set a schedule and keep it. Work on research, networking, letter writing, you know, Monday through Friday or noon to four every Tuesday and Thursday or Monday and Wednesday night, six to nine. You know, I've got a, I've got a Tuesday night class from six to nine. I'm going to do my I'm going to do my my job search on Monday, Wednesday from six to nine. Um, <clears throat> it, 
if you if you provide yourself with a process that's full time or part time but regularly scheduled, it will make it easy for you to just think of this as work. Then it's not like I got all my eggs in one basket. I went through the interview. I can't wait to hear. I'm not going to do anything else. I feel like I got this job. Then you don't get the job. Then you got to start the process all over. You know, your your job when you're looking for work is to keep pushing the pipeline, keep feeding the pipeline. Um, and if you think that it's just, you know, well, she's just in the right place at the right time. Well, how is it that she gets to be in the right place at the right time? And the answer to that is be everywhere. Go as many places as you possibly can. Be in the mix as often as you can. If you're trying to find a job in the nonprofit sector, then attend opportunities where the doors to key decision makers are momentarily open. Um, the Foundation Center, Candid, BVU, Philanthropy Ohio, the Levin College, um, we're bringing foundation, nonprofit, and corporation executives in as keynote speakers. And just be, you know, a lot of what's going on with COVID is virtual now, just like this meeting, but people are still doing socially distant, real time, face to face opportunities. Go to, if you feel safe, if you feel comfortable, mask up and go to this thing. You know, they, they may have 100 people in a room the size that, that fits a thousand, but there's an opportunity for you, you know, from six feet apart to introduce yourself to the director of the organization that you wish you were working for, uh, to have a face and a name put together. Um, City Club Forum, Cranes Cleveland Business, um, you know, United Way do all these public forums. Uh, there's annual awards for excellence. Uh, Center for Community Solutions is coming up on this Friday. Um, if, you know, it's a great annual thing. It used to be wonderful networking opportunity, you know, with 30 tables of 10 in the room, 300 people and a chance to, to glad hand and talk to people and get some business done make some introductions and, and follow up on proposals and process and all of that good stuff. Um, but, but even in the online, the Zoom environment, there's an opportunity to be a part of the conversation. You know, I'm looking at Brittany and James right now. You know, if you guys chat, you know, are, are engaged in the conversation and ask me for information and ask me if I can send something to you, you know, and I send it to you, now you've got my email address and sometimes my email address has my phone number on it, you know? So just by, by nature of, you know, asking in the chat or asking a follow-up question, you're making a connection to the executive, you know? And, you, and later on, it's really important for us to have their direct contact information, to have their direct phone. If we're gonna, you know, back in you know, later on when we're going, I'm not getting the follow-up here, you know, now I can reach out to them personally because I've got the, I've got the contact information. And if you're out in the, if, if you're out in the regions, if you're in our rural communities, our rural marketplaces, chambers of commerce, Kiwanis clubs, and, and our city hall, whatever the municipality is, they provide public events, there's opportunities to meet people. Um, and if it's about who you know, then our job is get to know people. Um, going to these events gives you access to folks. Uh, attending virtual events gives you an opportunity to ask questions, participate in network. Um, and But before any of that, start at the top. If you wanna work for the Centers for Families and Children, or some similar organization, then, then figure out who in the Cleveland, greater Cleveland, you know, when you wanna stay here, who in the greater Cleveland community provides those kinds of services or similar services, you know? Well, it depends on what, you know, what you're looking at, but it could be, there's several youth serving organizations. There are several organizations that serve women. There are several organizations that provide services to, uh, to homeless folks, you know, first uh, safety net, first call for help kinds of things. Pick a half a dozen organizations that you go, oh, man, I love this. I'm passionate about it. And I wish that I could work there and reach out to their executive directors, go straight to the top and ask for an informational interview. Have an opportunity to meet her before uh, you, you get an opportunity to, to put the, the, um, the, the, the paper in the basket. James, is that a question? No, oh, just thumbs up. All right. Um, so, and, and keep in mind too, as busy as they are, particularly at the top, all the way to the, skip all the other managers, go right straight to the executive director or the, or the CEO. As busy as we are, our hearts are in, particularly if you're associated with the university, but even if you're not, our hearts are in it. You know, if James reaches out to me and says, you know, look, I, this, these are my credentials. This is what I've been doing. I really, really, really want to work you know, at, 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 in, in housing, I really wanna work in, in, uh, in equity uh, and, and in social justice. 
and and uh, I've read about you at Habitat for Humanity and the work that you're doing and, and your your you know your resume personally you know blew my mind and I would I'm begging you for 15 minutes or half an hour to just sit down and talk to me about what are the options for me as a professional to work in your business you know uh, I, I'm interested in Habitat I'm interested in the community development corporations I'm interested in urban development you know you use all the right buzzwords uh, you know and and it's hard for me to say no particularly if you're, you know, I'm a Levin college student, you know, um, it's, it's very tough for people to say no, because somebody else did that for them. Somebody mentored them, somebody helped them. And we all feel as busy as we are, like, like there's a, like there's a, a pay it forward, pay it back kind of thing that says there's a quid pro quo in the universe that a lot of people help me get where I am. And if some young person is reaching out to me or some career transitioning person, you know, maybe somebody my age, but I'm trying to do a career change here and, and can you help me? Um, I'll give you 15 minutes, you know, a half an hour. Um, and those informational interviews, also opportunities to volunteer and, and to stay in touch. Again, and if I went out and, and met with six different corporate, you know, or, or nonprofit executives who are in the family services business, and now I'm in a position where I'm, uh, you know, I have an opportunity to apply for a job at one of the organizations if out of those six people that I met with, one of them and I really clicked, you know, and we've like had a little correspondence back and forth and stuff, I can reach out to her and say, I'm interviewing for the gig at the YWCA. Do you have any pointers for me? Right. And she may or may not respond to that. She may or may not be able to you know, be willing to give you another 10 minutes on the phone, you know, or she may say, I, you know, I don't know what to tell you, but if you want, I'll take a look at your resume for you or whatever it is. Um, but again, it's a, it's a reason for you to stay in touch with her. It's also an opportunity when she's out in the community at one of these public events that she also goes to because that's where she finds the councilman that she needs to get a signature from. It's where she finds the person that, that, uh, that where she got a grant application on the table. It's where she gets to run down her board member that's been dodging her phone calls. All of these people are doing all of this networking before, after, and during these events. So she's out in the community and guess who she bumps into? Her buddy, who's the executive director at the YWCA, you know, and she says, hey, you know, I just interviewed Brittany and Brittany said that, that you, you know, that, that she just came from a meeting with you, you know, and I laugh and I go, yeah, she's, you know, she's, she's pretty bright. And, you know, and I, and I, I don't, I'm not gonna give you a glowing reference cause I don't, I don't know you that well, but if I've been in touch with you, I'm going to say she seems to have solid credentials. Sometimes that's all it takes for that person to go back to her office or back to her person and say, hey, you got an application in there for Miss Cable, throw her in the maybe pile. You know, so sometimes it is about who you know. So your job is to get to know as many people as you possibly can. Um, and the number one way, if, and you know, and this is again why and how people change jobs, it's a 2015 survey, but I'm sure this is still current because. The, the 1975 survey would have told you the same thing. The number one way to find out about a job is through a referral. And 35% of the employees that they, you know, that they surveyed said, I make referrals specifically to help my friends. So if you know people, if you've got folks out there in the community that are in any kind of capacity, then, then you wanna ask them for help. Um, and if the answer is no, right? So then, you know, then I get the Dear John letter or I bug them and I bug them and I finally, you know, and she finally shoots back an email or, or answers my phone call and says, hey, Jeffrey, I'm sorry I haven't gotten back to you, but, you know, we, we went in another direction, right? Um, again, you're not alone and it's not personal. As, as sad as you may feel and as angry and frustrated as you may be, it, it doesn't mean that you're not a good candidate. It doesn't mean that you're not a good person. It means somebody else was the right person at the right time, somebody else had the inside track, somebody else interviewed better than you did, somebody else, they felt the chemistry more, somebody else was coming from another marketplace because their partner got a job in Cleveland and she just wants to be working in the field and she's willing to take a $40,000 pay cut to be working again, you know? And, and, and when you start interviewing higher up the ladder, you know, I, I was in executive searches where I was, you know, interviewing to be the executive director of an organization coming from being the executive director of an organization. And I got priced out by somebody from another marketplace 
who you know was also a candidate commanding the same level of salary that I was looking for. But they said, look, I, I'm moving to Cleveland and I, and I want to be working and I don't want to be working in a step down job. I would much rather be working in a step down salary. You know, so I will take a pay cut and, and promise you that I won't go anywhere for 24 months. Um, you know, and bingo, there we go. You know, I, I outbid. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not personal and, it, and it's, and it was in no way reflective of me. It was literally, they came back to me and said, you know, we were, we were set to go with you, but, but for 40 grand, we're not. And, and I was like, well, you know, I would discount 10. <laughs> you know? And he said, that's what I thought you would say. And we both laughed, you know, and I went and banged my head against the wall. And then tomorrow I started over again. Um, it, and I'm now one step closer to being the right person, the right place at the right time. You know, if, if my job is, if, if it's being the right person at the right place in the right time, then I want to put myself out there as many times as I can. Celebrate. Um, I got the interview. I got the callback. I got the reference check. I was in the top tier. I was in the top three. I was in the final two, you know, brag to your family and friends. Hey, it was, it was you know, it, I was the number two, you know, it was between me and one other person. I went through all that process, all those interviews, all of those people, and I got all the way to the final shtick, you know, um, and accept no gracefully and joyfully. And keep in mind that if you went through all those interviews and the background check and the, and the meet with the different groups and, and the on-campus visit and all that other crap, you know, you go through all of that process. They hate telling you no. They hate it. Even though they decided the other candidate is better, the last thing they want to do, this is another reason you get ghosted because I can't bring myself to give her the bad news. So I'm just gonna dodge her for a while, you know, and, until it becomes so painful that, that because she's just bugging the bejeebers out of me. Now I just call her up and go, hey, I'm really sorry. You know, and it's a really abrupt conversation. You feel horrible because you had all this great chemistry with them and then on the phone, they're like, hey, look, I'm really sorry. We had to go another direction. I wish you all the best of luck. I gotta go, right? She wants to get the heck off the phone because it's very painful for her to tell you that. So take the pain and pressure off, you know? Oh, you went with the other guy? That's awesome. He had great background and, you know, and, and I can appreciate what a tough decision this must have been for you. I'm really happy I made it into the final two. Um, can, I would love to, to take 20 minutes with you to debrief and just, you know, we don't have to do it right now, but would you be willing to schedule a Zoom call with me? I would love to get, you know, some feedback about how I can improve this process. And, and by the way, you know, she's like, well, you know, you did great. It's not about you. And I don't have time for that. You know, well, is there anybody else that you know that might be looking for somebody with my passion, my commitment and my skill set? And back to my previous example, where I went out and met with the top three CEOs of the or executive directors of the family organizations in town, you know, that connection that I made that, you know, out of the six, that one woman where we had some chemistry and, and she even helped me you know, uh, looked at my resume and did some stuff, you know, I, I can, I can reach out to her and say, who else in the community do you know that might be, but I can also say to the person that I just went through the interview process with, they loved me. I was the number two candidate. I made it through a thousand applications. I made it through a boiled down interview of 20 telephone interviews. I made it through, uh, you know, 10 people got invited to do zoom interviews. I made it through three people got invited to do Zoom interviews with the staff and two people got invited to do Zoom interviews with the board. They loved me. They just didn't love me as much as the other guy, right? So while they love me, if I take the pressure off, if I'm not like, oh, okay, I'm sorry, you know, and we have that really uncomfortable phone call, be enthusiastic, ask for feedback right then. I'm so happy you did that. What was it about, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna ask you to compare apples and apples, I think Roger's a great guy. I looked him up online. I saw, you know, I knew who my final competition was. And I think you made a great choice. I'm happy for you guys. Who else do you know that could use somebody like me? You just spent seven hours with me in the interview process over the course of the last three months. That's a lot of time, you know? Who, who else can I go to? Um, send them all a thank you note, everybody in the process, all the people you interviewed with, all of the people that, that, that helped you. The, the secretary, the executive assistant that managed the appointment process, send her a note, send every, and you can do this with by email, you know, it doesn't have to be a bunch of handwritten notes, you know, but send everybody a quick note thanking them. And when you do that, include another copy of your resume, another, uh, you know, in, uh, to your LinkedIn page. And the same thing that I just said, who else do you know that might be looking for somebody of my passion, commitment, and skill set? 
here's my paperwork. Get them to pass it along. And sometimes if you're nice enough about it and they really did like you and they feel guilty enough, they'll send your paper off to four or five of their colleagues because it helps them feel less guilty, you know? But, but the only way you get that kind of action from the person who's given you the, the Dear John note is to take them off the hook, you know, the pain and strain and stress that they're feeling. Celebrate the no, make it okay, make it okay for them, you know, make them want to help you. And if you do that, you can, you can move really much further along because the people that are, that are dropping you are trying to hook you up, you know? So, so think about it as, as an opportunity um, to move forward in your process. Um, and when it takes forever, when they just, you know, when, when, when you feel like you've been dropped or ghosted without a whisper, a whimper, a goodbye kiss or a slap in the face. This is like dating, man. I put all my time and energy into this, you know, and we had three great dates and I was really feeling the chemistry and everything, you know, and then bang, you know, all of a sudden she's not returning my phone calls. It feels like this sometimes. We put all this time and energy, you know, that's why we use the language ghosted, you know, which technically was about date, you know, originally it was about dating, but now in the literature, it's all over the place relative to, I made it all the way through the process and I don't hear them anymore, you know? Um, don't let it take forever. For in the first place, if you're four or five weeks behind anything, then you're not managing your process as efficiently as you could be. Ask about their timeline during the interview and then hold them to their timeline. And that doesn't mean if he says, you know, we should know by next Wednesday what the next step is going to be. Then I don't want to call him at Wednesday on five o'clock and I don't want to call him on Thursday. He needs Wednesday to finish his process. And maybe the last person they had to reschedule the interview. So now that moves to Thursday morning, you know, maybe it postpones to next week, but Thursday, I want to give him an opportunity to, to um, clear his desk and get through his process. But if he told me they should know by Wednesday and he's had all day Wednesday and all day Thursday to reach out to me, tap him lightly on Friday morning. Hey, just checking in, wanted to know where we stand, right? That gives him all day Friday to get back to you before the weekend. And he will make a point of responding to you before end of business on Friday. If you, if you hit him on Wednesday, you're over anxious. If you hit him on Thursday, he feels guilty because he didn't get back to you by the end of business on Friday. And now you're going into next week, you don't have an answer and he feels guilty. You know, Much better way is to just know about their process from the get-go and then gently but firmly hold them to their timeline. What happens next? Who else do we need to meet? You know, who else are the final candidates going to meet? Um, and in that place, in that in, in that sentence, don't personalize. Who else do I get to meet with? Well, you know, we're going to decide as we go, Jeffrey. You know, but if I say, what's the process for the final candidates? You know, then they don't think that I'm trying to trick them into referring to me as one of the final candidates. You know, by the same token. When we're talking about other stuff, I sort of assume, you know, in my interview, I talk about how are we going to do stuff? How is that going to work for us? You know, when we're approaching the foundation, you know, my experience has been that we're going to do it this way. Is that how you would like for me to do it? You know, you, 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 you assume that you're in the, you know, that you're already accepted in the process. But, but when you're asking about the timeline, put it back into the, into the, into the, uh, um, uh, the general and not the specific, don't make it about me. What, who's the, you know, because what am I going to have to, who else do I have to meet? That assumes that I'm a final candidate and she may not be willing to, 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 to park that, you know, um, she feels like I'm trying to trick her into saying I'm one of the final candidates. Um, by the same token, uh, she'll tell me that the final candidates have to meet with the board, you know, and, and that typically takes at least a month to to hook up. Okay, great. So now, how soon can you about who's who's in the final pool? You know, she says a week from Wednesday. Same story. Tap her Friday morning. You know, but 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 you know, if if we ask good questions in the interview, and then we hold them to their timeline gently and firmly without being overbearing, it keeps the process rolling and it keeps them from just letting it go for weeks without hearing from us. And remember, the more anxious we feel the more guilty they feel, you know? So, and, and this is like a relationship back to ghosting. You know, if, if, if she's anxious and he's feeling guilty, they're gonna avoid each other for the next two weekends because she doesn't wanna deal with her anxiety and he doesn't wanna deal with his guilt, you know? 
and and then and then he you know they they break up by text message you know so let's not do that um and again you know after a routine thank you note wait a bit and get back to them um you want to behave as if you already have the job assume the interview to follow up call the job offer check in periodically send thank you notes invent ways to follow up i'm not impatient i'm excited i'm not pushing you i want this i'm the right person for this i truly believe that um, leave out something so you got a reason to follow up later. You know, if you've got like, if I've got this great eight and a half by 11 um, uh, PDF, that's the letter that I got from the people uh, from the certified fundraising executive uh, congratulating me on, on being recertified and telling you what that means. You know, it's, it's like my PR letter. And I wanted to put that in the package because you know that I'm a CFRE, but you don't really know what that means. I want to make sure you know that. Hold that back. You know, you've got my resume, you've got my, my letters of reference, all of that stuff. After the, after the first or second interview, there's an opportunity to say, hey, you know what? We talked about my, my, uh, my fundraising credential uh, and I, uh, I, I wanted to just send along the letter that I got from CFRE International. Um, I thought that might be useful to you in your process, you know? And you send that to the executive director and to people that you interview. Um, cultivate and steward relationships. Um, You've met with her, you're in the process, you know the process is going to be a month, they're not going to make a decision, hopefully before Thanksgiving, but maybe not, you know, they hope they have an offer generated during the holidays because they would love to have somebody start January 1. That's their pipeline, that's their process right now, you know, so there's urgency, but it's also, we got a couple months here, but if, if they're on the evening news, you, you saw her on the evening news, go to Channel 8's website, find the link. Go to Channel 8's website, be proactive. Go to Channel 8's website, reach out to somebody in the newsroom. Say, I saw the thing about Open Doors Academy on the news tonight. I would love, could you guys post that on your website so that I can share that clip with my friends? Now you got a clip, send a clip to her. You know, She's gonna send it off to all of her board and her friends and she's gonna be happy that you found it and send it to her. That's proactive, you know? And it also is just an opportunity to say, I wanna say congratulations on the great interview and I found a clip, here you go. Um, I, I saw the, you know, the, the, the thing in the Plain Dealer about getting the foundation grant. Congratulations on that. Is that, is that going to fund the position that we're talking about? Is that going to be part of the, the you know, is that going to help to pay for my job? You know, um, again, I'm assuming that it's my job. Um, and back channel if you can. Um, whoever got you in, you know, if you used a referral to get in, then, then send them copies of your resume. Send them copies of the, of the follow-up, you know. Um, uh, when you're first seeking an opportunity, when you're first going after them, who's on their board, who's on their staff, who's on their advisory board, who are their major funders, and then who do you know that is one of those people? Reach out to that board member of theirs or reach out to that advisor of theirs or reach out, to, if you've got a good relationship with somebody at the Cleveland Foundation and Cleveland Foundation is one of their major donors, tell your friend at the Cleveland Foundation, I'm applying for the job as the as the as the uh, the program officer for the Centers for Families and Children, um, you know, I just wanted to let you know that I'm in the mix. And she's like, "Oh, that's awesome! You'd be great for that," you know. Um, you know, feel free to tell them that. And she's like, "You know, I'd love to, Jeffrey, but you know, I can't do that." But you know what? When they when they meet at one of these other events, and she says, "How's the job search going?" And she goes, "I got I nailed it down to four final candidates." Then my friend says, "Is Jeffrey Bowen in the mix?" She goes, "Yeah. How do you know Jeffrey?" Well, he and I've been working together, blah, 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 blah. And it's casual, you know. She won't formally make a reference for you, but casually she'll tell people if they ask her. Um, you know, so figure out who it is that you know, ask them to reach out on your behalf. And 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 when they tell you or you decide that it's actually over, then embrace that next opportunity. You know, back to accept no with love and with grace and 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 go, hey, I'm one step closer to being the right person at the right time know that when the door closes that that doesn't mean your life is over and it doesn't mean the search is over your job is finding another job a better job a job that's more a better pay uh, that, that that's better for you that you like better or that's in your field or whatever it is that you're that you're looking for um, so so make sure when you um, um, you know when you get to that place where it's finally over thank everybody in the process and go right back to what I was saying before 
you know, thank the secretary that got you an appointment and hooked everything up. Thank the program officer that gave you a tour to facility. Thank the board member that met with you virtually and send them all a gracious note, you know, sincere, gracious, thank you so much. I'm so pleased that I was in the final candidacy. I love what you guys do, you know, and, 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 I, and I think it's great that you found the person that you feel is right for you. I wish you well, and but but you know we we seem to get along really well in the process. And I just wanted to ask you, you know, Marissa, do you know anybody else out there that could use somebody with my skill set and passion? Um, and then it gives them an opportunity to maybe, without telling you, pass your paperwork along to some other friend of theirs that sits on a board of some other organization that knows about the job. And I'll tell you right now, that's how I became the executive director of Greater Cleveland Habitat for Humanity. I was interviewing for another position and one of the people in the room said, oh my God, this guy would rock for Habitat. And he sent my paperwork to somebody who sent it to a lawyer to determine that there was no conflict of interest. And then they sent it to somebody else who sent it to a friend of mine who sent it to me. And, you know, and, but that's how I got involved in, in, because I didn't know that there was a search at Habitat for Humanity. They had been without an executive director for 11 months. And, and so it wasn't even on, it wasn't even posted anymore. They'd had two failed searches. They were in, you know, they were a distressed organization. We're having a lot of issues, but somebody met me on another, you know, on looking at something else and said, boy, this guy gets it. He comes from the neighborhood. He's got the right background. He'd be the right guy for the job. And as it turns out, that that ended up being true, and I ended up working there for ten years. Um, so, so be in the right place at the right time. Be gracious. Be thankful. Um, and let me know if you got any questions. Don't everybody speak at once. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Is that I really endured that I was sitting here writing notes the whole time. So that was absolutely amazing. I feel like I learned so much. And at this time, I would like to open up the floor if anyone had any questions before I bogart the chat. <laughs> questions. What do you think? Oh, oh wait, me or you guys can unmute yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah. Everyone should be able to. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to uh, chime in with a little bit about uh, some of our policies at ACLU that we've adjusted um, uh, relative to some of the stuff you said. Um, uh, one of the things that we did recently with an eye towards more equity and inclusion towards our uh, uh, network of people who apply for jobs being expanded, looking uh, uh, less like the people who are already at the organization, which is a historically uh, uh, white, middle-class college educated organization, um, is largely ignoring minor errors. Um, uh, you know, our first resume review is done by multiple staff members Mm -hmm. um, done based on a grading rubric created by HR and the hiring manager that seeks to more abstract the position so that people with a, a broad range of experience, uh, mm -hmm. of experiences, uh, would be considered even if they aren't, you know, uh, uh, four years of progressively increased responsibility at a social, no uh, social justice nonprofit, you know, and someone who's been, you know, grassroots organizing on their own. Right. Um, and, uh, uh, and look pretty much ignoring style and presentation. Uh, and one thing we found is that the people who are really conscientious about things like style and pre presentation and, and minor errors are, um, oftentimes regardless turn out to be the people with the right experiences. Um, right. and, uh, so as people are thinking about that, think about, uh, have, uh, uh, how can you, uh, uh, and I'll flip that into a recommendation. 
how can you write your resume, even if you aren't exactly what they're looking for in such a way that, and particularly cover letter that connects your experiences to the duties as they are listed. You know, people complain about cover letters, um, right. but I find them critical because they give me a narrative compared to a, a dry resume. Uh, you know, and, and that's, that, those are, that's a great point, James. And, and, you know, and it's interesting too, because in the, in the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, work that we're doing at Cleveland State University, we've developed a number of rubrics to help level the playing field in the faculty search process and the staff search process. And, and you know, to have, um, um, to make it possible for people who are not uh, necessarily, you know, like you talk about the grassroots organizer, somebody may have great chops in the field and, you know, but but their their resume is like, you know, an eight and a half by 11, um, uh, um, found a form online, dumped some stuff in there, you know, didn't talk, didn't really tell you what I can do because nobody coached me and I didn't take any classes on that. I'm too busy organizing, you know. Um, so the, so the, if the rubric says, you know, if you can write a rubric that will help to bring the people with the chops in, then you can, then you start to have that, that process. Um, important thing, though, particularly for young nonprofit professional network folk, you know, you guys in, you know, specifically in the nonprofit world and in the public sector world, volunteerism counts, you know, in the corporate world, they like to see that. You put it on your resume because they want to see that you volunteered at six different organizations and you did your internship at ACLU. You know, check that box in the HR department under corporate, right? On the nonprofit, I will look at a resume and say, she got a master's degree from the Levin College. She got one year of experience in the field, but she got six years volunteering for the Girl Scouts as a troop leader and three years as an organizer for the ACLU. I want to interview her, you know, but she's got to put the, the, you know, the, 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 she's got to make the, the Girl Scout program volunteer experience and the grassroots organizing uh, for ACLU stuff. She got to make that stand out in her resume. She's got to put that in there, you know, it, it, at the very least, make it look like a job. You know, it says volunteer, but, but, you know, but because in the nonprofit sector, we are so dependent upon people that work for us as regular volunteers in particular. You know, that cup, that woman who comes every Tuesday and Thursday from eight to five, and she is our receptionist on Tuesday and Thursday. We don't pay her. She's a volunteer. She's a very talented receptionist, you know? So that counts when, when, when she goes and applies for a job as an executive assistant, she decides to go back to work. You know, her two years of being, running our switchboard works, you know? Your, your volunteer time, even if it's, if it's, if it's episodic one-offs, list them, you know? But if you did something that's particularly um, valuable, you know, or if you did a project in your, in your academic life, you know, I took, I took Professor Bowen's cl fundraising class. Oh, that's nice. You know, I took Professor Bowen's fundraising class and I raised $6,000 for my, for the organization that I was working with, or I found $25,000 in, in, in qualified potential major gift prospects based on a semester long exercise that we did. That's what needs to go in the resume. You know, because people don't care that you took my class. They care that you raised some money for somebody. They care that you developed a prospect pool, particularly if you're, you know, if you're going after fundraising or marketing, they're like, really? You know, um, so it, and, and that back to your comment, James, is what gets the attention in the letter. You know, um, you, put, you put a hook in the letter that, that something that they can't say no to. Um, great, great feedback. Thank you. Um, other, other comments or other folks? I just wanted to say thank you for doing this. Um, I would love to get your email. It's kind of going back and forth with students, um, but just to follow up after this. Um, and yeah, thank you for taking your time out of your day. Great. I'd, I'd be happy. I'd be happy to do that. In fact, um, I will do that right now. J period N period Bowen at csuohio.edu in the chat. Um, yeah, and you know, feel free to reach out and 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 all of us at Levin are really engaged in in helping students 
Um, and we're also engaged in, in recruitment, you know? So if, if you're a Levin College graduate or a Levin College student, do not hesitate to reach out to faculty and staff for help because we will help you. Um, and if you're not a Levin College student or a Levin College graduate, but you're potentially a Levin College student or a Levin College graduate, reach out to us for help because we're also trying to recruit good talent into both our undergraduate and graduate programs. Um, you know, so, so and, you know, and, and particularly, um, you know, if you're engaged full time at an organization, our, our relationships in the community are deep um, and you almost can't work for a major nonprofit in, in Greater Cleveland without somebody on the team um, knowing the people that you work for. Um, and, uh, we got some other people in the room. Anybody else have other any questions or observations you wanted to make? Um, thank you for that, Brittany. Um, let's see, I'm trying to wait to see if anyone has a question before I ask one. Um, okay, I guess I'll, I guess I'll ask one. And you all can cut me off if, if need be. Um, I had a question piggybacking off of the cover letter question. Um, I feel like sometimes as an applicant, you can see how your experiences have kind of built a profile for your eligibility for a job that might not necessarily be chalked out in the job description. So what would be the best way to kind of formulate that resume in a way where you're almost kind of, I guess, selling to that um, organization, hey, I have, you know, based on your mission statement, you're looking for this, this, and this. And through this, you know, A, B, C, D, and E experiences, I've built this set. Like, how do you kind of um, advocate for your own eligibility, even if on paper, it's like, you know, that you're in medicine and you've got some type of construction background um, or something. It, it, that's a great question and that, you know, and I mean, there's, and, you, and you can find lots of blog space on, on those topics and lots and lots of folks that will give you conflicting opinions on what a resume should look like. Um, at the end of the day, we're talking about skill set and skill transfer, right? So when I moved into nonprofit work, um, you know, a, a after, you know, having, having done nonprofit work, as, you know, as a, a worked at the, the free clinic and a crisis intervention, you know, as a crisis intervention counselor during my undergraduate. And then I worked for Medina County Youth Services uh, for three years as a caseworker. Uh, and then I went in the restaurant business, but seven years in the restaurant business. And then I spent, um, you know, another 10 years in sales and marketing. You know, so I was 17 years away from my nonprofit work and I was trying to make a transition into nonprofit work. Um, everything on my, on my, on all of my materials was about what skills do I have? You know, what volunteer stuff have I done? Um, what is it that I know? What is it, what is my passion? Where have I been, you know, hanging my hat um, to, in order to get even through the door because it's like, oh, it's, you know, yet another sales guy who thinks he can do development work. Um, you know, and, you know, and, and on the hiring side, all those sales guys that think they can do development work, I'm always kind to them, but I always send them away. You know, um, it, but, but the person who reaches out to me and says, these are my skill sets, you know, this is what I've done. And I tell students this all the time. If you're doing deep volunteer work, talk about that, put that on your resume. You know, I've been working at the, at the pizza store for, for five years to put myself through college, but I work for five different organizations. I serve on two different boards. I, you know, I, I belong to three different professional organizations. That's what you highlight on your resume, you know. Um, you know, and how you set your resume up and, and whether it's one page or 20 pages that there's, everybody disagrees and, you know, and, and go to your expert source on that uh, and continue to change it and tune it up and feel like you don't have to send the same resume to everybody, um, you know, but, but for sure highlight, what do I know? What have I learned? What have I done? And if it's, if it's, if it's a project on the job or a project in your academic life, highlight that. Um, you know, talk about your passion for the, for the, uh, uh, you know, for, for whatever it is and become an expert on that. If I really want to do youth services, you know, that's my passion. I want to help kids. I want to help children and families and, and kids at risk. Then, then get to know who are all the organizations that serve children at risk in the greater Cleveland area and, and go to their stuff, you know, read their website, read their newsletters, get, you know, give them all a $10 donation and they will all send you everything you could possibly ever want to know about them. Um, you know, attend their virtual events, um, you know, learn who they are and who the players are and who funds them. And then, then when you get an opportunity to speak with somebody, you're asking really intelligent questions. Um, 
I landed a social work job at Medina County Youth Services coming out of Kent State University's honor program with a degree in psychology and having three years as a full-time um, uh, paraprofessional, but paid staff at the local free clinic doing paraprofessional counseling and outreach and education work, right? But in the interview, when I went to Medina County Youth Services, I talked, I asked the guy, you know, and I was competing with all masters and PhDs, child psychologists who wanted this job, masters of social work who wanted this job. And I was, I was coming at it, you know, as a, as a bachelor's degree psych student who had a whole bunch of field experience, you know? And, and so I got the interview because of some networking and some connection, but I was up again, I was the only one in the entire pipeline that didn't have at least a master's degree. The reason I ended up getting the job was we spent half the interview talking about his funding sources. Because, because I knew from the agencies that I worked with what a, what a tangle it was at, at the time in terms of how agencies were funded. So I was able to ask him questions about current events relative to the funding pipeline. And he spent 15 minutes of the interview sharing with me you know, what they were doing to counter the trend that was coming with Ohio funding. Um, and, and then it was like, we ran out of time. And, and so he offered to meet me for coffee so that we could finish the interview because we spent all of our time talking about stuff as two colleagues, you know? And then I went for coffee and over coffee, he offered me the job, you know? So, so I, I, I throw that out there just to say that it's, it's about what you know um, as much as it is about how you stand up on paper. Back to your thing, James, you got to meet the rubric. You got to meet the, you, you, you have to be able to get in the door, which is also why networking helps. You know, it's also why, uh, uh, you know, good references help. And, and, and again, if, I'm, if I want to work in youth services and I make knowing the Cleveland Youth Services community my job, and I'm going to work on that every Tuesday from four until nine, I'm going to spend five hours reading, writing, looking, you know, thinking, talking, looking at who's on their board, who's on their advisors, trying to find a link, trying to find a way in the door trying to find somebody that I can send my resume to and say, do you think I'm that, you know, that, 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 that you could help me get an appointment with this person to talk about my interest in her field, you know? And, and if she gives me a half hour informational meeting and then I talk to her like, I know what I'm doing. She doesn't care that I don't have two years of experience. She cares that I'm a graduate of the Levin College with a huge amount of volunteer experience. And somehow I seem to be an expert on youth services and their funding in a Cleveland marketplace. Um, Self-education works. And, and again, James, back to your, you know, your, your commentary about, uh, about the organizers. Um, folks that do organizing, that's who you want to hire as an organizer. You know, <laughs> you know? Um, he, he may not have a degree uh, or he may not have the right degree, but if he's got field chops, that's the person that's going to stand out from the pack. Um, outline to their cover letter and then draw conclusions, exactly. Um, other other questions or did you have something else, Nicole? Uh, actually, I, I was curious about, uh, in your experience, looking at people's application materials for things, uh, especially, let's say, uh, uh, early career folks, like folks in YNPN. Um, what do you find that early career resumes and cover letters that young people find think is really important that hiring managers don't actually? Um, I think the one thing that I, that I talked about already stands out because I, I do this with my students all the time. Um, um, we, we, they just list their college experience. You go to their LinkedIn page and it says, I'm graduating in 2020 from the Levin College and I studied this, this, and this. No expansion. No talk about the, they, they did a project for my class that was like, you know, they found money for the, for the Center for Families and Children. They, they changed the program at, uh, at the city mission. You know, it's like, for God's sake, talk about the work that you did. Put your internship out there as if it were a job, because it was. It was part-time, it was as an intern, it was paraprofessional, but they paid you. You did it for six months, and then you did it so well, they brought you back for another six months. So even though it was only you know eight hours a week, I worked for them for a year, and here's what we did during that time, you know. And what I see on the resume is I did my internship with these people, and I and I'm you know and I'm picking up the phone and calling the you know the, or sending an email to the to the guy, and saying you know who's asked me to be a reference, 
you know, I'm writing a reference letter for him and I'm looking at his resume and going, dude, you, you, you knocked it out of the park on that internship. You get one, they get one line item that should be your cover letter. Um, you know, so, so that, that, you know, I, I think the thing that stands out the most is not anything that I've, that I look at that I go, that's wrong, you know, is, is, is it is under expanding or underselling, you know, people whose resume is thin relative to the job description, then you have to put a cover letter together, you know, and or highlights on, on both a cover letter that, that points it out and highlights on the resume that show me that you've got the passion for the cause that show me that, you know, well, I've never had a job as a fundraiser, you know, but I, I raised over the course of the last six years, probably 20 grand on, on YouTube, you know, and, and on Facebook for my birthday. And last year I raised $3,000 for the city. You know, it's like, that's the stuff I want to hear about. Um, and it doesn't, you don't have to be applying for a job as a fundraiser. If you're applying for a job in the nonprofit sector and you've done fundraising, tell us that, you know, if you're applying for a job in the nonprofit sector and you've done advocacy and activism and street organizing, tell us that, you know, um, if, if you've done, um, um, you know, if you have personal experiences with, with stuff, um, you know, and that's why I'm so passionate about this organization, share that, you know, um, I lost my sister to addiction. What better person to be working for, for, uh, um, um, you know, for one of the organizations that, that's dealing with addicts and alcoholics, you know, passionate. If you go to something like Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, their entire board of directors has lost someone to a drunk driver, you know, um, you know, so, so if you, if you have a personal connection to it, um, share that, you know, which is not necessarily just, you know, they, they call it anonymous for a reason, you know, so it's, which is not to say out yourself as a recovering addict in your cover letter, because I don't think that's going to get you a job. Um, but to say, you know, if, if you've got secondary experience, um, you know, uh, you know, then I, people's, uh, you know, homelessness and aggression and anger and despondency is, is close to home. You know, um, I've, I've had tragedy in my family that, that, that I've grown through, I've learned from, and it really makes me passionate about this work. Um, you know, and, and, and again, the volunteer thing, use it to your advantage, you know, get, get, if you're looking for work and you and your resume is light, then find some volunteer opportunities to expand your resume. Um, I just talked to a graduate student from Levin uh, two days ago, who who's um, you know has her master's in nonprofit administration leadership, and she's she wants to get some fundraising chops, and so she reached out to me about is there a way that I could possibly volunteer to do grant writing for somebody for free just to get the experience. And I was like, you know, who do I recommend? And I was like, who do you want to work for? <laughs> you know, I turned it around the other side. I said, if you're, you know, with your experience and your degree and your writing capability and your writing sample, you're willing to volunteer to do all the legwork on a grant application, you know, reach out to any executive director that you're interested in doing that for and tell them they will at the very least let you do all the work and then send it down the hall to their to their development shop person and say, clean this up for me. I'm not so sure about her, you know. Um, but but you've already done the, the, you know the, the the lion's share of the work. And in this particular case, I know she can do it, you know. So I'm like, there's don't don't look for me to help you find a chance to do some volunteer work. Be aggressive, um, and and use that to get you know to to create relationships and also to put it on your resume, you know. If you if you write the grant. And the grant is successful, yay. If you write the grant and the grant is not successful, it becomes a tool for them to step to another grant to a different foundation using exactly the same materials. You know, so grant writers are always setting their stuff up to be replicable and boilerplateable and transferable. You know, so she does all the groundwork to put their mission, vision, values, staff and board relationships, all, all, you know, she codifies all of this stuff for a small organization that doesn't already have a toolkit and creates, she doesn't just write a grant, the first grant, big grant that, that that organization has is an entire tool belt. She can then put that in her resume to say, I gave them everything that they needed to do replicable, easy off the shelf grant applications where the executive director can do that herself without a full-time staff person. 
um, and 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 we were successful in secure, you know, in securing seventy five hundred dollars from the from the uh, St. Luke's Foundation. That stuff and that becomes the whole cover letter, you know. And and she may be working as an administrative assistant in a in a sales office for the last ten years, and that's also how she paid for her bachelor's and master's degree, and that's what she's doing currently. But the cover letter is going to be all about creating the grant package and successfully raising some money. Um, and that organization is going to continue to engage her, brag about her, and it, they can't afford to pay her, but that executive might help her to find another job. Um, and, and again, it's just about loving this stuff. You know, if you're passionate, you know, games, you love the work that you're doing, you know, you, you talk to people about it, it, it shows in your voice, it shows in your smile, you know, um, th that kind of passion and enthusiasm about the cause. Thank you, by the way, I, you know, ACLU, thank God for ACLU, especially today. Um, yes, really seriously, man, pop, vote with, you know, vote. That's my commercial for the day is please vote, um, you know, and, uh, uh, and ACLU is going to, you know, no matter what happens in November, ACLU is going to have their hands full for the next decade, just based on the last four years. Um, you know, so and, and theoretically, we're going to take the House and the Senate and the governors, you know, there's going to be this wave across America where we're going to have a sea change in leadership. And, and it's going to be fantastic and lovely. Um, you know, but even if we evolve into an anti-democratic fascist dictatorship, uh, ACLU is going to have work to do. You know, and and the more funding they cut, the bigger the nonprofit sector gets. You know, so you guys are in the right field for job security. Um, you know, the, the the good news that I mean, and I mean this with all sincerity. I'm not being flip. Habitat for Humanity and and Salvation Army and Red Cross are on the front lines every time there's a disaster on the coast anywhere in the U.S. or around the world. You know, so it it, it doesn't matter where it is. You see Salvation Army and, and Habitat for Humanity and Red Cross are in the front lines, boots on the ground, helping to muck out houses in New Orleans after the hurricane, helping to, to build emergency shelter out of recyclable materials that can then become Habitat for Humanity houses. You know, and the Red Cross is doing the, the front end emergency services work. Habitat is triaging and figuring out how are we going to shelter these people and how can we shelter these people building shelters that don't that then don't go into the junk pile. They, they go into the houses that we're going to build two years from now when we start to rebuild after this crap. And Salvation Army is feeding everybody every day, you know. So no matter how bad it gets, there's always going to be volunteer and, and paid opportunities for Red Cross and Salvation Army and Habitat for Humanity because they're out on the front, you know. Um, as sad as this, as this statement is, there's plenty of work for ACLU to do, and we need we need organizers more than ever, you know. So so the good news is 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 that is that while things are are crushingly difficult during this pandemic, um, it, just because of the pandemic, but also because of everything that's come to mind um, that you can think about in terms of mismanagement in the U.S. And the fact that we can't use our passports to go anywhere if we even wanted to get rid of this stuff, you know, if, if Trump re-elects re and half of America wants to go to Canada, the Canadian border is closed to us. Ironically, they, they've, they're, they're building a wall that says we don't want you here. Um, the, the good news is, is that we're having conversations about, about Black Lives Matter in every organization, top to bottom, stem to stern, every board, every executive office, every HR department, everybody is developing a rubric. Everybody is working on hiring practices. Everybody is doing what you're trying to do, James, which is we have to reflect the people that we serve. We're doing it at Cleveland State. We're doing it at the ACLU. We're doing it at every nonprofit in the community, every for-profit business. You can't go into a building in downtown Cleveland where they're not talking about Black Lives Matter. That's not happened in my lifetime. You know, The civil rights movement just took a monstrous leap forward. It's too bad under these circumstances, right? But the good news is, is we're having the conversations. The good news is, is we're all learning how to use Zoom. You know, the good news is, is that, is that no matter how much funding they cut, the nonprofit sector will continue to step up. The philanthropic community will continue to make gifts. Giving is on the rise. You know, it, the, the major philanthropic community is, you know, while the government is stealing the money from the people, 
with the support of, I mean, while the corporations are stealing the money from the people with the support of the government, the, the philanthropists are putting more money into philanthropy than ever before. Um, you know, and, and we will volunteer and we will work extra hours and we will take pay cuts and we will painfully learn to use social distancing and, and, and you know, take classes on Zoom and everything else because it's what it's gonna take for us to get through this. And man, what a beautiful time to be doing nonprofit work. Um, you know, this, it, it, as crazy as finding a job is, you will get a job and you will keep that job and you will move through opportunities as long as you're saying the glass, you know, people are arguing is the glass half empty or half full? And I say, celebrate the fact that I have a vessel, you know, because the people that don't have a glass can't carry water. They can only go someplace and drink water. The homeless populations around the world, the people that don't have water, the people that have to carry water, if they don't have a vessel, they can't carry water. They have to go to the source to take a drink. And if I got a glass, even if it's stone empty, I'm ahead of the people that don't have a vessel. So celebrate the fact that you have a glass, go find somebody whose glass is half full, ask them to share, they will, because the people whose glass is half full understand that I got more than the person that doesn't have any. So they'll give you part of theirs and then you can go give it to the people that don't have a glass. And, and the people over here that got all the water, full glasses and they're hoarding and they're hiding and they're trying to figure out a way to poison the water while the rest of us are trying to share, forget about them for a while, you know? celebrate what we got, help the people that have less than we do, make the world a better place. And sooner or later, the people that are hoarding the water or, or the people that are poisoning the water are gonna come to their senses. They have to. Um, and, and, and when they do, we will all have survived by helping each other. Um, and until then, we gotta stop barking at them and start helping the people that got less than we do. Because the greatest philanthropists in America are you. Um, the people who give a little bit to the people that have less than they do, you know, and forget about the billionaires um, and vote. Um, and thank you for being nonprofit professionals and thank you for caring about, about this. Thank you for inviting me to help. Um, I love you guys. Keep up the good work. And, uh, and thank you so much for this opportunity. I hope it was helpful. Thank you so much. It's an honor as always. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much. We really appreciate it. Seriously. Thank you, James. <laughs> thank you, Jennifer and Nicole, of course. Of course. Thank you. All right. Well, that was, I wish this conversation would not end. And I hope that we can have an opportunity to continue this conversation. So um, in the meantime, thank you and please stay safe. And, you know, it's just very motivating. So now I'm going to go and really try to shake this community. <laughs> Good for you. And uh, if you could send me a link, if the uh, if the recording is available, I'd like to, to a couple of people I'd like to share that with. And, of course. Uh, and, and keep up the good work, you guys, and I will talk to you next time. Sounds good. Great, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.